on location in the Holy Land. David Taverner from UCB travels with Bible teacher and church pastor Mike Beaumont to trace the life of Jesus then and now. Last time, Mike, we were talking about the trials of Jesus, a whole sequence of them. You did mention in passing the denial of Peter, which happened at some point during that. Just, just remind us again. Yes, we said that when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was taken down along the Kidron Valley, round the southern side of the city, and brought up those steps to Caiaphas' house, where the first of his many trials that night took place. And the location of Caiaphas' house is commemorated uh, in the church of St. Peter in Gallicantu, which was built over ruins that date back from really early times where Christians marked this as the place where Caiaphas had had his house. Actually, perhaps I ought to say his palace, because as you look at the ruins, some of which stretch way beyond the church, um, it clearly was a palatial home. This was the home of a very rich man indeed in those days. And the church itself sort of built almost on a rock face. It's very, very steep here. We've come inside out of the heat and sunshine into this lovely little quiet chapel. But uh, what a location. Yeah, absolutely. It's looking down here, down to the valley below as we can see the walls of the city of Jerusalem. As they stand now, we can look across to the Mount of Olives. And it is a, an incredible place. I mean, it was a great place for a house of a rich man to be built. Uh, he's certainly not there, you know, squashed in with all the smaller houses and the hoi polloi in the town. Uh, this is definitely a rich man's area. And a number of clues that this church is associated with Peter and his denial. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, although this is a modern church where we are built in 1931, um, it's built on a foundation that goes back much earlier, as I said. Uh, the first Byzantine church and monastery was built here in 457 AD. But this, this present church, I, I love it. And it, as you say, it does give hints of what the story is about all over the place. Perhaps the first one that you see, even as you're approaching from a distance, is that there's a golden cockerel, a rooster on the roof. And that immediately tells us, oh, yeah, this is going to be about Peter and how he denied Jesus three times before the cockerel had crowed. And then we come into the church grounds and we see this group of beautiful bronze statues, uh, four figures representing that scene from the denial. One of them is clearly Peter. He's sitting down there looking rather angrily at one of the young maids who asks him a question, as we'll see in the story at the moment, another maid passing behind, sort of looking curiously, inquisitively at him, and ominously standing behind a Roman soldier, eyeing up what's going on over there. So once again, you're getting a sense of what this story is about. And then as you go into the church itself, it's a, a beautiful church, the main sanctuary itself, you go through sort of wrought iron doors, which are covered with barry leaves from the Bible stories, go into the main sanctuary. And there's large multicolored mosaics on all four main walls, huge ones in semicircular fashion, portraying scenes from this part of Jesus's story. But Right ahead of us, as we go in, facing that entrance, is a mosaic of Jesus bound with ropes, being questioned at Caiaphas's house. So the whole of this church helps set the context for what part of our story of following Jesus this focuses on. And a reminder that while in one place, not far from here, Jesus is facing these show trials, if you like, in another scene, not far away, there's Peter, one of his disciples. Yeah, very close indeed, because as we turn to the story, we read that Peter manages to gain access to the courtyard of the high priest. Now, how on earth did he manage to do that? Well, you know, perhaps he knew someone who worked here. There was some sort of connection that enabled him to get in. Not everybody could just walk into the courtyard 
of the high priest's house. So he manages to get into the courtyard while here, where this church is, there would have been Caiaphas's house. And as we've said in a previous episode, in the ruins of that house are the cells and pits and stables and particularly a pit where we think Jesus was held while awaiting those trials. So Jesus is there suffering alone at times, being questioned while out here, Peter is facing a challenge of his own. Well, read for us the passage that this refers to in the Bible. Well, it's in all four Gospels, but let's read the account from Matthew's Gospel. We're going to read Matthew 26 from verse 57. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. And then we get the account of what went on inside the house. Meanwhile, outside, let's pick up the story from verse 69. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another girl saw him and said to people there, here, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth, but he denied it again with an oath, saying, I don't know the man. And after a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you're one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses on himself and he swore to them, I don't know the man. And immediately a cock crowed. And Peter remembered the word that Jesus had spoken. Before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. As we follow the story of Jesus, Peter crops up a lot and he does tend to speak before he thinks. Is this another occasion of that? Yeah, he, he's done that again and again in the story, haven't we? So good hearted, but so quick to speak. And I think that's exactly what's going on here. You know, he's got caught out. Um, he wasn't prepared for this, I think. And I'm sure all of us will have had times when someone caught us perhaps with a question when we could have testified for Jesus. And because we weren't mentally prepared for it or expecting it in that context, we, we sort of gave a different answer that afterwards we went away and thought, oh, for goodness sake, why did you say that? Why didn't you use that opportunity to speak for Jesus? I think all of us will have had that experience. I know I have. And, and I think, you know, Peter wasn't ready for this. I mean, if he thought about it, you know, going right into the lion's den there, as it were, to try and watch what was happening. You see, there was his good heart. He could have just run like all the others had done. But no, this good-hearted man wants to know what's going to happen to his master. But then he gets caught out. And he gets caught out, not by the sort of thing that's happening to Jesus, a high priest, a great high priest questioning him, ultimately Herod and Pilate questioning him. He gets caught out by a young servant girl. I mean, who would have thought that that would have been the thing? But so often, isn't it? It's the little things that catches out in life and that we aren't ready for and so he he does speak before he thinks here denying Jesus even you know swearing on oath that he doesn't know Jesus and then even when he's cornered as he goes to stand outside the courtyard thinking this is getting a bit hot too many people are asking questions here about what I'm doing um, some of the people say here hang on you were you were definitely one of Jesus' disciples. Your accent gives you away. Now, it's funny, isn't it? Because, you know, we read 
the story of the Bible and we, and we think they all spoke in the same sort of voice and the same sort of accent, mm. uh, probably exactly like us when we read the Bible. But of course, they had regional accents in those days, just like we do. And for a country like the UK, probably no country has as many different regional accents so close to one another in such a small country. Well, Israel at that time was very much the same. He came from Galilee up north. And so this really is the equivalent today of someone in, let's say, the posh part of London or the seat of power in London where all the rather nice speaking civil servants and government ministers hang out, hearing someone talk and say, hey, that, that I recognise that accent. That's a Yorkshire accent, isn't it? That's a Lancashire accent, isn't it? And it's as clear as a bell. And that's what catches him out here. You know, he might deny it with his words, but his accent now gives him away. And then he gets really angry and begins to call down curses upon himself. You know, may I be cursed if I've ever known this man. And then makes this oath to them, swears to them, I don't know this man. This is the highest oath you can make in Judaism, you know, to swear to something and call down a curse on you if what you're saying isn't true. I don't know Jesus. Oh, my goodness, how far this guy has travelled, metaphorically speaking, from when at Caesarea Philippi he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And now when challenged and asked, are you one of the followers of this supposed Messiah? Nah, never heard of the man. You got the wrong person. And you could have forgiven him the first time, but the fact that he goes on. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, like I said, we've, we've all got caught out, haven't we, at, at times like this about having to speak up for Jesus. But as you rightly say, he not only does it once, he not only does it twice with a different servant girl, he then does it a third time. And this is not within the space of several days. This is within the space of minutes, maybe two or three hours at most. He certainly had time to reflect on it and think, Peter, you idiot, why did you say that? But he doesn't. He holds his line. Why? Because he was frightened. The man he'd followed for the last three years had just been arrested, had just been taken off, almost certainly to be executed. And he was scared, like we get scared sometimes when it's time for us to stand up for Jesus. Because he put everything into this, following Jesus. He'd left everything, and now it looked as if everything was going to be taken away. Yes, and, and that must have been incredibly overwhelming in terms of what he'd given his life to and it looked like all of this was turned upside down now so this is not just upsetting this had upset his whole world turned his whole world everything he'd given himself to for the last three three and a half years looks like it is about to collapse like a house of cards and yet, when you stop and think what he'd seen, what he'd witnessed, the miracles, the healings. Yeah, and all of that would no doubt be going through his mind later, because we know later in the story, in an episode that we'll come to, he's deeply, deeply repentant for what he's done, ashamed of what he's done. Uh, and we'll need Jesus to give him a threefold declaration of forgiveness and a threefold recommissioning for life, because he feels he's, he's messed up so badly. You know, I've seen over my many years as a pastor now, people who've let Jesus down, either by what they've said or done, by their behaviour, by their denial of him, all sorts of things, and have come to a place of just feeling, that's it, it's rubbish, I'm rubbish, there's no future now. But the lovely thing about this story, this story that we are seeing here today, doesn't end well. But hang on. Wait for our future episode. If you can't, read on in the gospel yourself. And you'll find that Jesus will forgive Peter for this incident of denial. And not only forgive him, 
but recommission him and send him out to make a significant impact on the world. Why? Because if we handle it right, failure never disqualifies me. I'm thinking of the irony that Jesus is being tried nearby and Peter is being tried, in a sense, by witnesses. Yeah, tried in a whole different way here, isn't it? And, you know, that's the reality of life sometimes, isn't it? Our trials, our testings come in all sorts of ways. Some we can prepare for, some we can't. And what a contrast here. Jesus being put on trial holds himself with dignity, whether it's in front of Caiaphas or Pilate or Herod. There is not one instance, one tiny bit of suggestion that he's going to change his mind. You know, he's going to do it. Well, you know, that's not really what I meant. Oh, I know what I said. That's what I said. But, you know, I can soften that a little bit if that would make it easier. He holds himself as a man with dignity. Sadly, here's a man in Peter who's completely lost his dignity by denying this man he's walked with for the last three years. I mean, frankly, it's little wonder he was heartbroken. And actually, there's, there's an additional little dimension included in Luke's account of this story that helps us understand perhaps why Peter found it so painful. In Luke 22, verse 61 and 62, we read that just as Peter was speaking, the cockerel crowed. So there's the pain, first of all, because Jesus had prophesied, hadn't he? Before the cockerel crows twice, you will have denied me three times. And as he says that, no, I never know him. cock a doodle do in the background. Interestingly enough, we were just outside, weren't we? And heard a cockerel crying. Couldn't be more apt. But then Luke in his account goes on. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. So it looks as if at some point here he's being led through the courtyard. Perhaps it was now time for him to be taken from here to Pilate. And as he goes through that courtyard, he turns and he looks straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word that the Lord had spoken to him. Before the cockerel crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. He went outside and he sobbed and he sobbed and he sobbed because he knew that what Jesus had said was true and he knew that he wasn't the man he thought he was. He'd said to Jesus, you know, Lord, if everyone runs away, I'll be there for you. And now he'd discovered he was one of the ones that was running away. But I love that verse where it says, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And you can imagine, can't you, there, eyes catching with one another. And no doubt at that moment, I bet Peter had to look away quickly because he couldn't bear the master's look and I think it was not not a look of anger not a look of I told you so not at all I I think it was a look of it's what I said isn't it Peter because Jesus of course would want Peter out of this to turn and come back which he will do eventually so there's no anger there's no I told you so, but it is a reminder, is a reminder of the prophetic word that Jesus had given to him and that it was being fulfilled. And that look must have been so, so piercing. And yet at the same time, there must have been hope. I'm thinking of anyone listening who perhaps has a real sense of shame. And in a sense, Jesus looks at them, but isn't looking at them as if to say, I told you so. I have to say, first of all, the way out of everything is that we confess. While we cling on to things, while we cling on to what we've done wrong or said wrong or even what others have done wrong to us, while we cling on to that and hold it tight in our hand, Jesus can't do anything with it. 
But he looks at us not with accusation about what we hold in our hand. He looks at us really with invitation. It's really a way of saying, I was right and you were wrong. Now, come on, open your hand. Open your hand, take that thing that was wrong and let it go. Bring it to me, confess it, say it was wrong. And as we do that, here is the wonder of what Jesus does, the Bible tells us again and again. John says in his letter, you know, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 to 8. And all we need to do is, is to come to Jesus with that thing that's grasped in our hands, that sin, what we've done, what we've heard, what we thought about, wrong, what someone has done to us, but we've clung on to it somehow and bring it to Jesus and open those fingers maybe literally as a sort of picture before him and say, here it is, Lord. I'm confessing. And he looks at us, not with accusation about what's in that hand, but with invitation for us to open our hands, give it to him, confess it, and then receive his forgiveness, just like Peter would do. After Peter wept bitterly, what happened to him next? Well, we read there in the story, he went out, wept bitterly. And do you know what? We don't know exactly what happens next. Where we pick up the story with these disciples is they've run away and hidden. Now, after the crucifixion of Jesus, who is it that who hangs around? Bless him. It's those women who've been supporting him throughout his ministry. Any mention of the men there? Well, you know. Peter and John are there at the tomb. They witness that it's empty. But then they all go back and they're hiding in this room, possibly that same upper room they'd had a meal in, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that. What are they doing there? They're hiding. They're running away. They're keeping their heads down. They're keeping out of trouble. And actually, when this whole story is over and the risen Jesus will come to appear to them, he comes and finds them there, walks through the wall, walks through the door with that resurrection body of his and stands in their midst and says, peace to you. <laughs> wow. I bet that was the last word that they were expecting. Peace. You know, don't be afraid. Don't worry. My words, my presence here are ones of peace. So we don't know, but I think join the dots, if I can put it that way. And it seems that he went and joined the rest of the disciples. You know, he'd been the bold one. He'd been the one who come here. The others weren't here with him. He'd come here so courageous, so full of it, until he's caught out and collapses. And then goes and runs and hides with the rest of the disciples until the risen Jesus comes and appears to them. And that is only days later. So you can imagine when Jesus is raised from the dead and appears for Peter, for Simon, Peter, flashbacks in his mind to this moment of denial. Yeah, I'm sure that must have been. I think he found this very hard to get out of his mind. And that's why we get that story that we do at the end of John's Gospel, one of those resurrection appearances, now up in Galilee where Jesus sent his disciples back where, you know, so much of the story had taken place and uh, the the fishermen followers of Jesus had gone back to what they know they'd gone back to fishing and they see this figure on the shore who tells them caught any fish lads no cast your net on the other side and they do and suddenly they realized that it was the Lord Jesus and as soon as Peter hears John say it's Jesus, he wraps his outer garment round him, jumps out of the boat, wades to the land and comes to Jesus. Now, I think even in that, you know, if he was that embarrassed and thinking, I, I can't face this again, I don't think he would have done that. And he comes, why? Because he genuinely does love Jesus. He has messed up. 
but he does love Jesus. And as he comes to Jesus and finds Jesus has cooked breakfast for them, it's followed by Jesus then asking these three questions. And three times in John chapter 21, Jesus will ask Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three opportunities to say, yes, Lord, I love you, to cancel out these three denials of I never knew him. Now, if that is not the kindness of Jesus, I don't know what is. He's making Peter there face up to that moment. Remember coming with his hand and opening it. Come on, prize those fingers open, Peter. Let's face this issue together. We all know what you did. But come on, open your hand, release it to me. And as he does, through saying, Lord, I do love you. And the implication is, I know I messed up, but I do love you. And each time Jesus commissioning him, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. It's not over, Peter. It's never over for those who mess up, for those who deny Jesus. If they'll come to him and open those fingers and give it to him. So if the story had unfolded differently, here we are, the Church of St. Peter and Galicantu, remembering this story, his denial, if we'd been able to wind the tape back, as it were, and he was asked again by those witnesses whether he was connected to Jesus and he had a second chance. (laughs) Oh, I'm sure this time he would have loved to have said, absolutely. Here's the interesting thing, though. After Pentecost, he's able to do that. After Pentecost... He's the chief spokesman as he speaks to the crowds, almost certainly gathered there in the great temple courtyard for the festival of Pentecost, where all the Jewish men were required to be. The Holy Spirit now transforms this guy to be bold. Of course, he's not had that experience yet. You know, he's got the heart, but not the ability. It's only when the Holy Spirit comes that the ability will catch up with the heart, not through his own efforts and power, but through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. But I'm sure he must have thought many times in life, I wish I could have gone back and said it different. But you know what? None of us can go back. None of us can go back and rewind it, do it differently. Life's not like that, is it? It wasn't for him and it isn't for us. But here's the great thing we get out of this whole story and what follows. We can't go back, but we can go forward. We can go forward with Jesus. We can go forward with Jesus. If only we'll come with that thing where we failed him, let him down, sinned, got it wrong, and stop gripping it in our hands, because as long as we grip it in our hands, it accuses us. Own the hand. Give it to Jesus. Confess it. Let him wash it away and wash you clean. And next time, it absolutely can be different. We must just mention briefly the cockerel crowing. I mean, you said it was a prophecy from Jesus. He knew that was going to happen. But of all the signs Peter could have had, I mean, we heard the cockerel, as you say, just outside earlier. What's that all about? Yeah, I mean, it used to be thought years ago that cockerels only crowed, you know, early in the morning to get you up. But anyone who's ever lived anywhere near a cockerel will know that they've got this annoying habit of, you know, doing it at any sort of time of day. So I don't think it's about timing or anything like that. It is about something very ordinary. It's a sign from the very ordinary, yet the very noticeable. The thing about a cockerel is you can't miss it. You and I were just sitting out in the gardens here of the church a few minutes ago, and I'm not sure the cockerel was, but I think everybody through this valley must have heard it. So I think what it's about is a sign from everyday life, but an unmistakable sign that Peter couldn't have missed. And his experience, Peter's experience, is something that so many of us experience as well. So Jesus was there for him as he is for us. Absolutely. And let us never think that the fact that we have messed up or let him down excludes us for the rest of our life. Now, the devil will love to tell you that that is the case. You've had it. That's once too often you've done that. That's too big for Jesus to forgive. Or, well, you know, he might just accept you back, but sit on the back row and he'll never be able to use you again. 
This is untruth and lie of the enemy. The truth is, to quote from John again, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all, all, all unrighteousness. And that scripture is as true and as powerful today as when it was first written. Well, this, Mike, is the moment to pray. Lord Jesus, here in this place where we recall Peter's getting it wrong and his denial of you and the pain that then came out of that, help us to learn from this, to learn first that it's much better to speak up for you in the first place. But second, to learn that when we do get it wrong, that with you there is always forgiveness if we will come to you with that thing so tightly grasped in our hands and open those fingers and say, Jesus, I own up to this. Now, please take it away. And forgive me and use me, even as you forgave and used Peter all those years ago. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mike Beaumont and David Taverner in the Holy Land, tracing the life of Jesus then and now. Check out the UCB website for the free episode guide with photos, Bible references and background information. Go to ucb.co.uk forward slash Jesus then and now. And you can hear more 30 minute conversations with Mike and David talking about the Bible on the UCB player app. Under podcasts, just select Bible books, Bible biogs or Bible surprises. Bible surprises.